Good morning. I do hope you are keeping well and you have continued to delight in the true grace of God. How is your identity as God's chosen person shaping your life? Are you living out your Christian mandate? Welcome to today's sharing and allow me to pray for us before we start. O oh Lord, you have made us for yourself and for your glory. We therefore praise you, our God and our Savior. We pray that you remind us again of our identity as pilgrims and how this shapes how we interact with societal authorities. This morning, we pray that you will help us to sit under your word with all feed humility. In your name, we ask these things. Amen. We have done three sessions through the book of 1 Peter. One real danger we might encounter is actually forgetting the bigger picture. Let us remind ourselves of the big ideas and where we have come from. 1 Peter was written to encourage elect exiles to stand firm in the true grace of God amid the suffering they were facing from the Roman Emperor Nero and pagan Roman citizens. There was a big danger for the elect to give up, give in, compromise their faith, or to conform to their environment. Also, they are wondering, or they were wondering, who is the Lord? Is it Nero or is it Christ? If Christ then submit to him alone, this would resort to rebellion and hatred toward Roman authority and toward the hostile pagan citizens. Peter aims to achieve this encouragement by constantly reminding his audience of their identity, their lifestyles, or what ought to be their lifestyle and their mandate or mission. We have seen in chapter 1 and 2 that the true grace of God, or what the true grace of God is, and how it will give Christians this new identity as God's chosen people for reigners here on earth, and how this grace shapes their lifestyles. Last week, we saw how the true grace of God shaped the Christian mandate. And this was a call to live for the glory of God, declaring his praises in all of life. Today, we start another big section from chapter 2, verses 11 to chapter 4, verses 12. In this section, Peter will be reminding his audience how standing in the true grace of God as exiles look like. Here, he will specifically narrow down to submission and suffering. Today, we look at chapter 2, verses 11 to 3, verse 7, thinking about submission. Allow me to read the text, then we we'll dig right in. Reading from NIV 1 Peter 2 11 to 3 7. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exile to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor or the supreme authority, or to the governors who are sent by him to, to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people 
but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourself to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bear up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you are called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that should follow in his step. He committed no sin, and no decent was found in his mouth. When they heard their insult at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for lusciousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you are like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Wives, in the same way, submit yourself to your own husband so that if any of them do not believe in the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. When they see the purity and reverence of your lives, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyle and wearing of gold or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past, who put their hope in God, used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husband, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as a weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gra gra gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. And that's the word of God. The title of this sharing is Stand Fast in Grace Through Submission. Stand fast in grace through submission. We look this in three ways. One, submission to authorities. Two, submission to masters. And three, submission in a family. This whole section is introduced by verses 11 and 12. Peter sets a pattern for believers' lifestyle which is then expounded in greater details throughout the section. This verse says, Lead, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagan that, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Christians are exiles, pilgrims, foreigners, sojourners, and aliens in the world. This is both geographically and relationally in the sense that the place in which they live is not their true home, and the people among whom they live are not their true people. Because of this identity, Peter calls his audience to live godly lives, to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against their souls. Remember, we looked at this in detail in chapter 1, verses 14. By abstaining from sin and pursuing godly lives, they will silence the opponent and be the means which those very same opponents 
are found glorifying God. How does living godly lives look like? How does standing fast look like? Here, it is submission to the societal structures and the family setup. Chapter 2, verses 13 to 17, 18 to 25, chapter 3, verse 1 to 6, and verses 7 will in detail help us see this. How does this look like? 1. Submission to authority. Verses 13 to 17. How do we naturally react to the idea of submission? You see, human beings are anti-authority. Of course, we see this light from the Garden of Eden. We are, by nature, labels. And the Christian that Peter is lighting to are not in any way different. Even much so, by the fact that they are being persecuted, right, left, and center, by the Roman Empire, they can and, be, and they'll be tempted to rebel. Perhaps even stage a protest. Peter reminds them by the fact that they are exiles, the earth is not their home, they should submit to every human authority. Look with me at verses 13. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as a supreme authority or to the governors. Christians are to submit to every human authority, emperor or governors, because they are God ministers appointed to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. Verses 14. Note, however, that this submission is for the Lord's sake. And this, for the Lord's sake, will apply to every other kind of submission. What this means is that the Christian's high allegiance is to the Lord. In case human authority contradicts the word of God, Christians should say no. And Christians ought to say no to human authority only and only when their commands are in contradiction to the word of God. Otherwise, Christians should submit to all human authority. Note the tension in verse 16. Live as free people. Do not use your freedom as a cover up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Christians are free but also they are slaves. They are free and slaves in the sense that Jesus and not the emperor is their ultimate king. Heaven and not earth is their ultimate home. Having been set free by Jesus to live under his authority, Christian can freely obey and submit to human authorities. Their freedom in Christ is not a license to cover up evil, but for their real king's sake is to do good by submitting to human authority. This is what the true grace of God achieves for these Christians, acknowledging their true identity, their true king, and therefore submitting to the, to the authorities he has established here on earth. In doing this, the ignorant talk of foolish people, their opponents, are silenced. Verse 17 is actually a perfect summary. All should receive the respect they deserve. All humans, including the emperor, should be honored. Fellow Christians, the members of the same family, should be loved accordingly, and God alone should be feared. How does standing fast look like? Though this word is not your home, and Christ, not Nero, is your Lord, do not rebel. 
For standing fast in the true grace of God means you submit to all human authority for the Lord's sake. But the second way we see this is submission to the masters. Verses 18 to 25. This is a second specific application of the principle in verses 11 and 12. And, and it reads, verses 18, Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. Note that the slaves master relationship in the first century is equal to the 21st century employee-employer's relationship. Peter is calling his audience to fully submit to their masters, not only to those who are good, but even to the harsh ones. Christian slaves should submit in this way because they are conscious of God. The slaves' motivations come from their attitude to God and not their master's goodness. Verses 18. This again places a limitation on the extent of their obedience and submission. If a master requires them to do something of which God would not approve, the slaves are to resist, even if such resistance leads to to unjust suffering. Peter gives two reasons why Christians should submit. Reason A. It is commendable before God. Verses 19 and 20. These verses assume slaves will suffer under the hands of harsh masters and therefore explain why a slave should even submit to them. Note the phrase, this is commendable, in verses 19 and 20. It is totally ununderstandable in the eyes of the world to endure unjust suffering patiently. But Christians are not part of this world. The God to whom they belong, verses 9, considers it commendable for Christians to imitate his son in this way. And so they do. There's a there's literal point in suffering for doing evil, verses 20. Because anyone can do that. But to endure the sorrow of unjust suffering is something commendable before God. But the second reason is Christians are called to imitate Jesus. Christians are called to follow in the steps of, the, of Christ who persevered in godliness in the face of much provocation and suffering. His death on the cross not only saved his people, he suffered for us, verses 21, and thereby heals us, verses 24, and returns us to a shepherd, verses 25, but also establishes the blueprint for our lives, and especially for the way that you are to respond to the unjust suffering. Note that these is erosions and quotation from Isaiah 53. Christ conducted himself with all integrity of Isaiah's suffering servants. In words and deed, Jesus was innocent of all sins. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, so he did not open his mouth. He did not stand up for his light. Instead, he was convinced of his father's justice. But his death was not just an example. Christ died so that we might live righteously. And in this specific context for Peter's audience, this means slaves submitting to their masters. Even as you endure pain due to your consciousness of God, keep going. Do not hate or rebel against your earthly master. Instead, 
imitate Christ and you are suffering especially for doing good and submit to them for that is what it means to stand fast in the true grace of God. The third way we see this is some mission in a family set up. Chapter 3 verses 1 to 7. Just as all Christians are to submit to authorities and slave to their masters, Christian wives are to be subject to their husbands. Verses 1 of chapter 3 leads, Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your husbands so that if any of them do not believe in the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. Note, as in 2.13 and 2.18, this obedience and submission is for the Lord's sake and is to be with reverent fear for the Lord. The wife is to submit to her husband even if he is not a Christian. Note that the aim of a wife's submitting is that the unbelieving husband is worn without words. Juan Sanchez, commenting on this section, says, This is not a call to silent witness where no conversation turns to Christ because the unbelieving wife is sticking to the without words. Peter's thinking in this section will lead to verses 15. Be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope. Sanchez continues to say, Peter is saying to the wives, if you have come to faith in Christ Jesus, your husband will eventually know of your faith and as he sees your conduct changing, he will ask about it or it will come up naturally in your conversation. Allow your husband to see the gospel at work in your life as it increases and magnifies your inner beauty. Verses 3 and 6 goes into details about it, eternal, internal and external adornment. The point here is that Christian wives should not try to win their husband over by externally or by external physical adornment but by internal and fading beauty of gentle and quiet spirit like God hoping women of the old. Here, giving Sarah as an example. Husbands are also not left out of this. While their wives are submitting to them, husbands are to be considerate as they live with their wives. Look down with me at verse 7. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as a weaker partners and as heirs with you of gra gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Husbands are not to exploit their wives' weaker positions, probably a reference either to relative physical strength, but husbands are to respect wives. The reason for treating a wife in this way is that Christian wives are heirs with you of gracious gift of life. Whatever difference of law exists between a husband and a wife within marriage, there's no difference when it comes to God's grace. Husband and wife alike have a certain inheritance that never perishes, spoil or fade, since both have been born again of imperishable seed and both are being built into God's house. This equality of standing before God motivates a husband to be considerate toward his wife and to respect her. Verses 7b carries further the encouragement for husband to live this way. Honoring his wife will mean that his prayers are not hindered. It appears that treating his wife inconsiderately or dishonorably actually breaks husband's prayer. 
God chooses not to hear such prayers. Wives, standing fast in the true grace of God means submitting to your husbands, not looking for external ways to win their approval. And husbands, standing fast in the true grace of God means being compassionate and treating your wife with respect. How do we apply this section to us today? 1. Keep your eyes fixed on Christ. We have seen from verses 21-25 that Christ is both a substitution for salvation and an example for our living. Because we are saved through him, we have these new identities as foreigners, strangers, and aliens here on earth. To stand fast in the true grace of God, we ought to keep our eyes fixed on him, on Jesus. This is the only way we will persevere and overcome trials, persecution, and suffering that are so certain to come. We need we need not only the grace to come from the that come from salvation. Sorry, we need not only the grace that comes from the salvation that we have, but also the example that He portrays for us. Standing fast in the true grace of God means fixing our eyes on Jesus, persevering through every kind of suffering. But another way is to submit fully to all authorities. This text confronts our natural inclinations. We are insubordinate labels. We love things our way and do not appreciate rule and authorities. But the scriptures here are calling us to submit to all authority, to the good ones and to the bad ones. To submit to our political authorities, not because we voted for them or we love them, but even when we don't love and agree with them. Most leaders in this country are not lovable. We have different political orientation and preferences. Most of us might, might not even agree with our government. But regardless of this, we are called to submit to it and to every authority. Submission is not only obeying the rule of law, but respecting our leaders. Think of how we talk of our president or his deputy. Do we think it is respectful? How do we submit to our local leaders? Are we respectful? Remember, every authority is God's appointed minister to commend good and to punish evil. At our workplaces and placements, are we submitting to our supervisors? Are we honoring them by completing our assignments in time and submitting our reports when they are due? How do we respond to pointless commands, unfairness, and false accusations? Are we living honorably in all of life? Lastly, maybe a resounding reminder. Friends, do you think yourself as a stranger here on earth? How is this changing your life, your priorities, your goals, and the things you hold close to? You see, unfortunately, we rarely we think of ourselves as strangers, but indeed we are. Sisi, no apitanjia. And this ought to completely change our lives. This should make us totally different from everyone else. This should make us counter culture. I pray that we would be those who acknowledge that we, not, we are not only chosen of God, but also we don't belong here. And that this would entirely change our lives. <music>